Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk on the last day of the summit. Um, it's nice to see everybody filing in for a security talk and, and making the time to be here, so we appreciate that. Um, my name's Rob Clark. I'm the lead security architect for HP Helion, and I'm also the uh, OpenStack Security Project, PTL. Uh, presenting with me today will be Arvind Tiwari and Dave McCowan. Um, we're going to talk to you about a few different things, and I'm just going to run you through some of the crypto stuff that's going on in OpenStack today. So in this talk, we're going to talk about encryption capabilities, about key management, and then about some new projects which involve um, localized VM key management, uh, which accelerates your path to having encrypted VMs, and a new method of doing full disk encryption for cloud deployments, which should allow you to deploy sort of entirely self-encrypting clouds. So I'll talk to you a little bit about encryption and where we are in OpenStack today. So this is how product sees OpenStack. Okay. Lots of cameras come up. And this is more like how developers see OpenStack. And this is how security people tend to see OpenStack. <laughs> and of course, we all know that the way to solve security problems is to encrypt everything. We'll encrypt all the data at rest, we'll encrypt all the data in transit, and then everything will be nice and secure. Unfortunately, encryption isn't really a silver bullet. It's a useful tool, and it's the focus of this talk. But just when these technologies come through, the path to securing OpenStack will not be complete. Um, there's a lot more left to do, but encryption technologies are something that we're constantly asked for. So in clouds, you really have three different levels of encryption, these three tiers. You have application level, OpenStack native, and full disk encryption. So application level protects you at, at the application layer. It protects the data in your applications in the cloud. It's very useful for migrating data between clouds securely. There are good, uh, good products out there that allow you to do application level encryption. OpenStack native that I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about allows you to protect entire workloads at rest, allows you to cryptographically isolate tenant data, which means that in certain situations, you may be happy enough to have, say, Pepsi and Coke running on the same devices. And uh, can, in some situations, with appropriate key management, protect you against operator intrusion. Full disk encryption encrypts everything that touches disk. It's generally a requirement for a lot of data center operations, but it's normally an unmet one, and I'll go through why. Um, it allows you to do a number of things, but basically you're protecting disks when they're removed from a data center, be it through an RMA process or anything else. And as OpenStack has this horrible habit of spraying credentials all over drives, it's nice if they're encrypted before they leave your organization. So OpenStack native encryption actually overlaps a little bit. It can help with some of the application level challenges and can help with some of the challenges that full disk encryption does as well. So where are we with solutions on these today? Application level. It's pretty much been solved in the commercial space already. Um, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that because we've got loads to cover. But those are three companies you might want to go look at. OpenStack native encryption. So here we're really looking at the, the most core services in OpenStack, be it Cinder, Nova, and Swift. And in a minute or two, I'll go through the status of each of those services and where they want to be by the end of the next release. And full disk encryption. So I work for HP. HP sells very expensive secure encryption hardware that is awesome and great, and you should use it. If you don't want to use it, I'll tell you how you do it for free in a minute. <laughs> so this is basically how, uh, how a service, any one of these core services is going to operate. Um, they can operate, obviously they can drift from this. Uh, so your service, be it Nova or, or, or whatever, will run encryption through, uh, through its own encryption. So all the encryption will happen within the service. Keys will be brought in probably via Castellan, extracting keys from Barbican, which will in turn probably be talking to an HSM. Um, you see here we've also got Solometer in this orange audit trail. It's really important to know what's using keys and what's performing operations in your data center. And this is just kind of the general framework for all of the OpenStack native encryption services. So Swift today, there's some experimental code. Um, Swift turns out to be one of the hardest services to encrypt. Uh, you would think it's probably one of the easiest ones, but because of the way Swift manages chunks of data spread out across many, many platters. Um, it's very difficult to pull back an individual chunk and decrypt it on its own or do a key rotation on it because your entire object in a naive solution would have, would have been encrypted before it was sprayed across the disks. You don't want to have to reassemble a terabyte-sized object to be able to rotate individual bits. So it becomes quite messy. 
um, they're aiming to have encryption be a real a big priority for this cycle. So hopefully we'll see more out of them. Much further down the road is uh, Nova ephemeral encryption. You can boot encrypted uh, Nova drives today. Uh, not many people support it in their production products, but if you go through the documentation and there's a, doc a um, security docs article in review at the moment that, that addresses this, um, it will allow you to boot Nova encrypted drives. However, it relies on libvirt, uh, libvirt LVM, which at the moment doesn't support migration. So you have a choice between being able to migrate or being able to encrypt. Lastly, the last core service I'm going to touch on here is Cinder. Uh, Cinder, again, will allow you to create, uh, access uh, encrypted drives that you attach and remove, or encrypted volumes that you can attach and remove. There seems to be some problems at the moment with booting encrypted volumes. Um, my understanding is that both the roadblocks here, so creating encrypting volumes from images and actually booting encrypting, encrypted volumes directly are being addressed in the next release. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Dave. I have no idea if I've run long or short, so I'll, I'll try and work that out before I speak again, and I'll pass over to Dave for key management. All right, so at this point, as Rob described, your data is encrypted, it's in one of the services, and it's safe and secure. Um, that was the easy part, apparently. The hard part, then, is what do you do with the key? Your data is encrypted, it's protected with a key. Uh, you shove it under the mat, and you're good to go. Uh, unfortunately, there is no mat in, in the cloud. Um, so um, that, that's the question, is where do you put the key? And uh, the good news is that if a black hat does manage to, to capture your data uh, without your key, um, he's left with a bunch of garbage. Uh, the bad news is that if you somehow lose your key, you've also lost your data, and that's also a bad scenario. So we need to have a key manager that works with your cloud. Um, so you want to have uh, you know, the following attributes in your key manager. Uh, one, it needs to enforce some sort of access policy. Uh, you want to make sure that the black hats uh, cannot get a copy of your key, but you can always get a copy when you need it. Uh, and to that end, it's highly available. You don't want your data to be available just sometimes. You want it to be available whenever you ask for it. So your key needs to be also available um, whenever you ask for it. Uh, you want your storage for keys to be durable. Uh, you don't want a, your key to be lost if there's a power outage or uh, um, a server crashes. So you need to make sure that your key storage is durable. And you want to have some sort of auditing and logging. You want to know. Um, um, if there's a compliance check or an audit of some sort, you want to be able to have a record of when keys were accessed and by whom. And you want it to, uh, to scale to your needs. Um, depending on your cloud, this may be once a day, once a startup, or it could be every time you access data. And of course, whenever you're building a system, you want it to be easy to use and low cost and high performance. Uh, of course, you can't have all of these things. So um, you need to uh, figure out what your use case is and design for that. Um, two options uh, that are available today. Uh, for your cloud um, for key storage. Uh, so Barbican is the official OpenStack key manager. Um, it keeps copies of your keys. Uh, you have an option, you can uh, have a back-end plug-in to a hardware service module, which uh, protects your keys in a FIPS-compliant manner, um, or you can tie it to uh, just an encrypted database. Um, in this case, it's you know, compatible with, with OpenStack. It uses Keystone. Uh, you can choose to use role-based or um, ACLs to protect uh, who has access to your keys. And it ties in well with Keystone and Oslo and the OpenStack command line and SDK. So you're all set there. Um, if instead of encrypting at the OpenStack native layer, you're encrypting at the um, infrastructure layer, uh, then you need to put your keys somewhere else, maybe directly into an HSM and, uh, and manage the access to that, uh, that separately, uh, away from uh, OpenStack protocols. Um, but just having a place to put it is not enough. You, it's not just a, a project, but you need to design a strategy that meets your needs and an architecture that meets your needs. And in this case, the type of things you need to be thinking about. Um, as a customer, do you want to keep control of the keys uh, yourself and uh, take on um, uh, that responsibility to have an HSM on your own site? Or do you trust having the key stored in the cloud um, with your data and, and protected with uh, the cloud availability? Um, another question, do you want to have one key or many keys? Does each of your uh, data records need to own their own key, or is it one per project or one per cloud? Um, another question you want to think about is, uh, is key rotation or replacement. If a key is compromised, can you change to a new key? Um, you want to build an architecture that has redundant storage, and then you need to figure out, do you need some sort of backup or recovery um, scenario? Do you want to keep a copy of your key that's entirely offline in, uh, in a disaster scenario? Um, and again, you can't have all of these, so you need to pick which ones you do, uh, 
uh, you want and prioritize as you design your system. Um, so here's some uh, specific examples of how you can turn encryption on in your cloud um, in DevStack or your production uh, available today. So here's an example of Cinder volume encryption. Uh, simplest way, I want to put my key somewhere, we'll just stick it in my configuration file. Um, that's great for DevStack. Um, there's other you know, secret bits, maybe your rabbit password is in there anyway, so uh, you might think that's a reasonable idea. Um, so no judgment, you have to decide what works best for your system. Um, another option, if if you don't think that people have access to your configuration file should also have access to your data, um, here's how you would tie Cinder in with, uh, with Barbican. Again, in your um, uh, Cinder and Nova configuration files, just point to your, uh, your Barbican instance uh, the URL and uh, you'll have encryption for your Cinder volumes. Um, talking uh, inside the VMs themselves, if they need a copy of an encryption key, uh, one way to do that is just embed the key right into the image that you boot. Um, probably not a good idea if you want to share your, uh, your image with someone else or if you, just because someone has access to your image if you don't want them to have access to a particular volume. Um, so in this case, you can go back to Barbican and keep your keys inside uh, the key manager. A um, couple different ways uh, using code available today to pull the key, the key um, out of Barbican into your VM. You can use the OpenStack command line um, as in the first example. Um, the downside there is then you have to give Keystone credentials uh, inside your VM. So if you want to avoid that, here's another example. Um, if you use Ansible for deployment, you can use the Keystone credentials uh, of Ansible to pull a copy of the keyword, stick a copy of it inside the VM, and then the VM can, uh, can boot and it's ready to go. Uh, but you can see from these examples, it didn't meet all our use cases. Um, um, there's you know, lots of things that you have to trade off, but we definitely need uh, more options to cover all our use cases. And uh, that's what we're going to present next. Um, two uh, complementary uh, proposals. One's Project Marshall and Project Leeson. Uh, the first one, Project Marshall, um, Arvind's going to come up now and, uh, and present this. It's an example of an OpenStack native encryption strategy. And then Rob's going to come back and talk about Project Leeson, which is an example of a full disk encryption. So here's. The <coughs> Thanks, Dave. Hello, everybody. We have been looking for a key management solution for uh, Cisco Cloud Services. And we choose uh, Barbican. That uh, doesn't mean we are in production. We are serious about it. So uh, we have to solve uh, multiple encryption use cases. And uh, uh, volume encryption is one of the important ones. So we, st we started looking into the current uh, encryption support in uh, OpenStack. And uh, we felt that um, uh, not all of the use cases can be solved. So we started investigating, and uh, we are uh, working on an agent-based solution. So if not all, but it's going to solve a lot of problems. So that is what I'm going to solve, um, uh, talk about. And uh, so we have done some work over there, and uh, we thought, OK, let's bring it to the community and um, discuss with the uh, smart folks here and get feedbacks and enhance it and make it usable for everybody so that we can use. So here is uh, Marshall. So Marshall is a key injection uh, and encryption agent, and its uh, slogan is keep calm, Marshall is on. So what is Marshall? So Marshall is an agent or daemon uh, process uh, running inside the VM, and uh, it fetches keys uh, from uh, key management system, um, and uh, Barbican is the main focus, but idea is not to uh, um, depend on one. Try to make it, and uh, there are regions for it. So. And it interface uh, with uh, encryption, encryption subsystem of operating system. And uh, <clears throat> inject, get the key from the uh, key management system and inject uh, to, the, to the encryption subsystem. And dmcrypt and bitlocker are the, uh, uh, everybody knows that. It is an abstract abstraction, so we can use any encryption subsystem, uh, maybe proprietary, or uh, we can also integrate with the key management system, as long as uh, uh, you are talking in REST or KMIP. So we haven't done anything in the, uh, with the KMIP, so we are, we are uh, testing with the REST so far. And uh, this is the high-level flow, uh, how uh, the encryp whole encryption uh, will work. So user will um, go to the horizon and create key as per their need. And key will be stored in HSM, and uh, next user will go and um, uh, try to spin up um, some uh, Cinder uh, volume. Or maybe uh, they have their own existing volume. So they can have n number of volume, and uh, now next they want to attach that volume with the new uh, VM, or they want to attach with the uh, existing VM. 
So they can have uh, n number of VM. Uh, so Marshall is uh, is a <coughs> component cooked, cooked up with the with the uh, image. So it will be uh, it will be running over there, and uh, so after attaching the volume with the VM, uh, 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 so Marshall provide a command line interface, and uh, from there we can say, okay, Marshall, I want to encrypt this particular device, and uh, it has it will have some some information which I'll I'll show in in, in my demo. Uh, and based on that information, it will go and pick the key and inject it to the to the dmcrypt model and forget about the key. From there onward, the <coughs> uh, disk I/O will be encrypted and protected. So basically, Marshall is going to provide more transparency, flexibility, and control and features. And uh, it is abstraction, as I mentioned, so we can integrate with other key management system if needed. And uh, so, why Marshall? So, as uh, I mentioned, current uh, encryption is pretty rigid. So, it uh, made uh, OpenStack, Barbican, and it is very well defined uh, <coughs> flow. And uh, in a, in a multiple use cases, uh, uh, at the customer environment, they don't use Barbican, and they want to keep their existing key management solution. So, we thought, okay, let's not ask them to migrate everything. So, try to use their existing key management solution. Another problem with the existing is it only support uh, uh, Linux virtual machines. So there, there is no support for containers or, or uh, Microsoft Windows uh, VM. It support uh, full disk encryption only, no root disk, uh, disk or partition. So Marshall can uh, fill those kind of gap. And uh, it is OpenStack centric. Uh, it means uh, it uh, expect uh, Barbican and uh, pretty much open, open stack architecture it required. And on-prem on uh, key uh, uh, integration is not the focus right now, but it practically it can be integrated. <coughs> and uh, benefit, uh, it is transparent. The user can choose their own key. And it is, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, we can support Linux as well as uh, Microsoft uh, virtual machine. It is cost effective. What that means is if you have your existing uh, key management system, so uh, we can we can utilize that without migrating your code. Migration is costly. So, <clears throat> and it is extensible. So we can we can use it for root disk encryption or partition, and monitoring target certificate is these are not the focus of this project, but that can be doable. And containers and bare metal are the uh, next uh, focus for this thing. So these are the roadmap. We have done some work. Uh, not everything is done. So full disk encryption, uh, we are supporting it. And f uh, for the fine grain, we are we have tested with the par uh, uh, partition. Containers are the next thing which we are, we want to work on. Microsoft Windows, we haven't done much, but uh, that is the next thing. <coughs> Ability to fetch, uh, fetch key from the on-prem, that is, again, we haven't done anything. So these are the, the roadmap for uh, Marshall. And uh, OK, so gaps, which is uh, why we are here to discuss. And uh, anybody can guess with this kind of solution, authentication is the biggest uh, uh, issue. And um, um, you can expose uh, uh, way to the key management system. So there are some uh, options we are thinking. So first thing is uh, one-time trust. So in the keystone, uh, there is a um, one-time trust. So we can use it to get the key. And after that, there is no way to access the <coughs> Key management system, short-lived token, another thing which we need to discuss with the key management system, and with right set of automated script, we can uh, also fill the, that gap. And uh, uh, Barbican community is working on uh, uh, per secret policy, which is also uh, going to help here. And we are trying to introduce a concept of license. Key license is something which is uh, which is which will be generated by Barbican through the API. And idea is Marshall. Okay, so idea is uh, Marshall is going to use the license to access the key, and Horizon integration. We have done something, uh, but which is a kind of hack. But uh, uh, we can share uh, if uh, that looks uh, good. Automation uh, next thing uh, which we are going to focus on, and uh, security of uh, key in transit. So there is a feature in uh, transport key which can be utilized for this. <coughs> These are the uh, standard deployment uh, model. So generic image or standard packaging can be utilized. So <clears throat> next uh, expectation, we are uh, looking for support from all the communities and inputs. And uh, OK, we have already uh, uh, shared the code as well as Wiki. So go ahead and look into it. And uh, we have also opened a blueprint for uh, uh, Barbican. So 
<laughs> Next is a demo. So we are going to show a short a demo which is mostly manual. We are not using the automated um, uh, heat template or something. So these are the agenda for the demo and let's see if I can. Uh, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> so keep calm, Marshall is on again. And uh, so these are the agenda. We are going to create key through Horizon, and uh, we are going to use Barbie can orders and secret resources. And uh, we have also tested with uh, one of the uh, uh, other key management system uh, called Hashika Vault. And uh, we are going to show full disk encryption as well as the uh, single partition. So this is the interface. We have done um, some work on the um, Horizon. So from there, you can create an order, and uh, <coughs> you can choose your different parameter. So you can see order is created. And from there, you can uh, 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 get the uh, uh, secret reference. Or you can uh, go and list the secrets and get the secret ID. So end goal is to create a license. So we are creating a license that is pretty, pretty clear, and we are putting a, a credential which is not good. So there I mentioned we can use um, uh, different techniques. But the uh, idea is to create a license. It, is, it, has to be, it should not be that open. We can, we can do a better job over there. So <coughs> license is going to have metadata information about the key, for example, key ID and the endpoint or some kind of credential information uh, so that it can access it. So here we are using the Horizon to spin up a VM. And we are providing image with Marshall cooked into it. And we are providing the license through the cloud config. So these are the manual way of doing it. But see, VM is up and running. And license is embedded into the VM. And from there, OK, this is the license format for the Hashika key. And we are attaching the volume now. and. These are the <coughs> command uh, for um, Marshall. These are the uh, Marshall specific uh, commands. And now we are uh, uh, giving a command to encrypt the device. So, so this is, uh, <coughs> uh, we are, and it provides multiple options to choose from. So you can choose your cipher and, and see, uh, uh, we, we are checking the status and it is the encrypted, uh, it is encrypted now. Now next we are uh, doing the partition of device. And uh, we have created two partitions, and we are trying to in encrypt a particular partition from there. So it is, it is encrypted, and you can see the status in the next uh, screen. OK, so you can see that we, uh, it can encrypt the particular, particular partition also. So that's all. Rob, <coughs> let me close this. Thanks, John. Cool. Thank you very much. How awesome was that? See, encryption works today. All right. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about Leeson. Uh, Leeson is a project that we've, we've worked on for a little while that we're, we're just going to socialize now, really. Um, it's a crazy idea for managing full disk encryption in Linux at scale. So it's fairly decoupled from OpenStack. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the state of the art in Linux full disk encryption today. And that is to say that your laptop could well be encrypted. And you type the key in, and your machine boots. Great. Unfortunately, that doesn't really scale too well at data center level, because you don't have people running around your data center typing in key material all the time. And um, beyond a certain scale, you expect that machines are basically going to be in a constant state of reboot. There's always going to be something rebooting somewhere. So the state of the art is someone, something, some system will notice that machine is rebooted. And in the very best example I can find, will IPMI into that box over what is probably an unsecure network, and then type in the key material over the serial console on the box. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually the machine will boot. Unfortunately, what normally happens is it sits there waiting for a key, and waiting for a key. And you end up with something a friend of mine called CryptoDOS, which I quite like. It's a state in which your data set, your um, machines in your data center are failing to operate because they're waiting for key material. So to address some of these challenges, we've come up with a project called Leeson. 
um, and it addresses, you know, Linux full disk encryption is over 10 years old, hasn't changed an awful, awful lot. In most models, it requires external intervention, someone to go in and type something or some process to trigger to go and bang a key in over IPMI. So what Leeson does is, in, it's a really scary idea, so you're going to have to bear with me while I explain to you how it works. Um, it reverses normal key ops, so we go to a pull model instead of a push model. And that means we have to change some things about the way parts of the system come up, but it allows us to make some interesting guarantees against certain threat actors. But basically what it's doing is binding disk crypto to the network, and the strap line for this, if you're trying to get product people involved, is it will allow you to build self-encrypting clouds. That is to say your installers can make sure every single part of your system comes up encrypted. And, and if you couple that with OpenStack native encryption through Marshall or through the other services that are coming and add application layer on top, then you'll have that wonderful full encrypted stack. So I, I warned you this was going to be a scary idea. And you just kind of have to bear with me. And just remember the base we're working from. So our threat model, which I'll talk about after I've told you a little bit more about Leeson, basically involves people stealing entire chassis. And when they do that, you can't trust anything that's stored anywhere on that chassis. Um, the only things we know that we can trust, really, are the IP address a machine comes from if it comes over TLS, because TLS guarantees we're talking to who we think we are, and the UUIDs of the volumes in the box that need to be booted which we can take as reasonably trustworthy as their UU, UUID fours and not reasonably guessable within our lifetimes, et cetera. So Leeson has two phases. It has a registration phase and a retrie retrieval phase. So registration, as you can tell in this very, very technical sequence diagram, involves a, a client box coming up, assigning UUIDs, and this will be like the first time it's come up, the first time it's been pixie booted or whatever. And it'll go and register an incredibly secure key, in this case, dead beef, uh, against a UUID with a Leeson broker service. And Leeson has been connected to over TLS using a publicly signed cert. So it knows that this client, at least right now, that it's talking to is 10.2.45.122. And it stores this mapping of IP address to UUID to key maps. And you know, everything's good and fine. Then the machine reboots because machines are constantly rebooting in your cloud. And when it reboots, it sits there and it, it, it tries to mount a, mount a disk and realizes it needs keys. So it starts to Leeson again and says, can I have the key for this UUID? Remember, I can't store credentials on this box. I can't have a USB stick in this box with key material or credentials. I can't use a TPM for a couple of reasons that I'll go into further on. But basically, for now, I can't guarantee that all these machines will have TPMs. So I ask Leeson for a key. Leeson looks at where the request has come from and looks at the mappings that it has. Now, remember, a UUID isn't reasonably guessable. So it looks at UUID and uses it as a proof of possession so that the machine that's requesting it has the disk that's requesting it. And it looks to see if the request comes from the same place that made the registration. If it does, it gives back the key. Hugs, everyone's happy. This is kind of what Leeson looks like in a more typical deployment. Um, this is taken from, you know, it's vaguely Helion flavored, but should look familiar to anybody. Replace control node with director or whatever, and you translate to whatever your distribution is. Um, and basically, we end up with a simple architecture like this, where Leeson's running on the control nodes. Initially, it would run on the installer for the registration phase. And I mentioned the threat model and why we can't necessarily trust things. Most disk encryption schemas work by protecting the individual disk. It's fine to do system measurements or use TPMs to derive encryption keys from system properties. If the only thing you're trying to protect against is somebody stealing a disk, uh, or a disk going missing through RMA or something like that. Unfortunately, sometimes things go very wrong. Um, our threat analysis or our threat model for this includes entire chassis or even entire racks, including the HSM going missing. And I'll tell you why. I once worked at an organization that paid very, very close attention to how much data you brought in and out of the building. Any disks, any CDs, any hard drives especially, you needed a lot of paperwork, exactly what was on the disks. Security had a very well-defined process for doing this, right? If you wanted to walk out of that building with five chassis on a wheelie truck, wearing highly visible clothing, the security person would put down their checkboard, would come across and open the door to help you out of the building. <laughs> this can and does happen. So we can't rely on any system properties to guarantee it, so we tie it to the network. This is why we have this lease and service. We can't use HSM credentials, even if we wanted to. If you could guarantee they couldn't be stolen or they're in a separate locked compartment. Um, HSMs don't like it when you try and set up 
10,000 users on them. They, some of them don't like it if you try and store 10,000 keys on them. So we can't really use those. We can't store the credentials. Uh, Bottom-up attacks I'm going to mention in a minute, and I've just brought up everyone's favorite crypto-related uh, cartoon, not that there are many, um, which is to say that it's important to keep in mind the human factor when you're trying to build crypto systems and understand what's actually being protected against. And this is one of the things we're looking at with Leeson, is, is an insider who has the ability to influence the network to some extent, who has the ability to physically access and remove hardware. Um, and this, this insider can operate in a number of different ways. And years ago, people might have thought this was being extra paranoid, but you know, Snowden releases around tailored access operations in the US and how disks were tampered going between manufacturers and sources or on the way to RMA facilities and other things shows that these sorts of attacks can and do happen. And we've always traditionally liked to draw this very strong boundary between what data at rest protections will protect against and what live system protections cover. And or, normally they don't mix. And with Leeson, we started to mix them and say that we do care about how you get your key material. Even though we only ever care about this being cold data, we still don't want this guy to be able to retrieve key material for another disk, even though it should only be protected when it leaves the data center. Um, so that's why Leeson uses the UUIDs to guarantee that it is giving you some close mapping to, to what you should have. It should mean that he can't reasonably guess the key material and retrieve it for drives and before he takes them out of the data center. He might be able to, he looks like a competent fellow, but we're trying to raise the bar. And like I say, remember where we're starting from, manually punching in keys over the serial consoles. Right, so I think we've got time to do this. Right, so if that, this is only an interesting demo if you really like, like watching boot screens. So the point of this, you know, Leeson is proof of concept code. So this is post-registration, and what we're going to do here is just show, in this case it's a VM, but just imagine it's a machine in your data center booting. And this will only be interesting to people who have run into this problem at scale, right? So here's my machine booting. It's coming up. It's doing its various checks. Um, this was run on, on Tim's laptop, and this demo would be faster if we bought him a nicer laptop, so I've made a note to do that. Um, but the key, the key request is going to come up in a second. And the nice thing about this is you've got network-bound request for key ID with proof of possession. The key passes back, and then you've got a full uh, Debian system booting with full disk encryption for each of the volumes it has. And you're into login, and that, would ha that scales to 10, 20,000 machines in your data center. Um, so we've left a bit of time for questions because some of this is a bit crazy. Um, so yeah, so that's it basically. That's our talk. I think I can do a slide advance somehow. There we go. So yeah, so Leeson binds crypto keys to the network, protects against entire chassis theft, protects against your HSM being missing. In the case where everything gets torn down, um, your, your bootstrap for bringing your cloud back up is you only need to manually punch in a key for one of the Leeson nodes because everything is encrypted in this, including the Leeson service that's running and the data that it has stored. So if you switched off an entire data center and switched it back on, everything would be sat in crypto DOS waiting for key material. And you go to Leeson and you give the Leeson server its key to boot. The other Leeson servers, because you'll be running in HA, will be pinging each other, they're waiting for one to come up. As soon as it comes up, they can boot, and then everything else in the data center can come up on its own. So in the event of like a big disaster recovery or a big failure where everything has disk material, um, because this is nice and HA and scales out and it's all done in software, it will all come back up pretty damn fast. And uh, the last point here is just the one I've tried to reiterate throughout this talk. It is probably the least worst way to do Lux at the moment. And uh, that's actually, I think, a reasonable step forward. So I think we're on to questions. Um, so Dave, Arvind, um, for Marshall and Key Management. Has anyone got any questions for any of us on what we've discussed? Yeah. yeah. Um, why can't you stuff an SSH server? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Why can't you just stuff an SSH server into the NetRAM and SSH in and drop a key or decrypt the drive and then continue boot? You can. That's still a push model, though, so you still require right, your that, note. Yeah, that's a push. 
Yeah. So you still require something to know that it's now time to go and SSH into this box. And I've never seen a data center actually do SSH key authorities appropriately, and you can <laughs> never revoke SSH keys. Yeah. And you can do TLS with the SSH as well. So. Well, you can do SSH certs. They're not TLS. Uh, Google, I'm fairly sure that Google's doing TLS SSH as like how they're doing their security internally. So one of the newer versions of SSH does introduce support for SSH certificates. They are slightly different to more normal TLS certificates. In fact, it's not TLS because it's SSH, right. but they might be using certificates in a, for, for auth N. Um, yeah, like I said, but... Right. That, that were actually, one thing I meant to mention, I see Nathan there. Um, there is also a, another project I became aware of while socializing this earlier in the conference called Dio, which is by Red Hat. The first version of what they do is very similar to what we do today in our proof of concept. Mm -hmm. The next iteration, which is something we're going to be throwing a lot of uh, attention to to start off with and hopefully get involved with, um, actually uses some, some homomorphic encryption approaches to, to really extend this technology out. Yeah. You still work from the same base that how do you bootstrap trust into a node that you don't have any right. trust anchor on? Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, so there's, it, it's interesting that it validates the approach we're taking and mm -hmm. the two can coexist, but I'm really excited by how we might be able to mix the two together and do something yeah. really clever with it. Right. And thank you for the question. Cool. So we, we got a couple down here. Maybe once you're done at the back, you can bring the microphone down. Sure. Uh, you assume that the there is a UI, UID and IP mapping there, right? Yeah. What if on a reboot because of DHCP, I got a different IP address? So that's an excellent question. Uh, we do pretty much need static IPs for this to work at the moment. Okay. Um, if you're happy enough having your DHCP be um, a, so earlier in the in the diagram. I showed a mapping to a CMDB and to an HSM. That's what the CMD ma CMDB mapping is there for. Basically, it's whatever your system of authority that knows how your cloud is configured is, it can be mapped against there. Um, yeah. So in our proof of concept, absolutely needs static IPs. If we were to build it out a little bit further with a CMDB integration, that's exactly where dynamic IP addressing would come into it. Yeah, that's because I'm thinking um, from the Ceph side of things, you've got lots of disks and the UID tends to come you can take a disk out, move it into another chassis because that chassis failed. So when you've got lots and lots of disks, that becomes a problem. IP changes and the UID mapping is really changing frequently. So for Ceph, this would, you'd, need, you'd need that extra layer you just outlined. Yeah, you absolutely do. I mean, we can, you know, you can introduce API extensions to allow an administrator to say, I've got to move this from here to there. But actually, the UIDs would change when you did. So you need some sort of short overlapping registration phase. Uh, that's what the CMDB is really there for, is to, to do those sort of things. Um, it's disturbing to me how many data centers don't know what disks are in what, ma what machines. Um, so we will kind of get hung up on that. But yeah, it's absolutely one of the problems we need to tackle moving forward. And I think there was a question down towards the front. Uh, Hello. Uh, how do you uh, how do you integrate Marshall into an existing OpenStack cloud? I mean, is it something you put on the Nova compute nodes or, Actually, or what? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, like we are so going to support the standard packaging, uh, uh, Debian package or uh, Red Hat uh, packaging, so we can do AppCat and uh, we can embed it. Is that at at the host level or in the VMs yeah, it's or inside the VM? It's on the yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is n one way. Yeah, or other ways we can uh, cook up uh, images with uh, Marshall and further okay. new uh, VM can use them. Yeah. I saw that Leeson supports high availability. Is it a particularly bad idea to run that geographically distributed? As long as you can either make strong assertions around the IPs or that you you have a good CMDB that can do that sort of geo distribution as well, that can keep track of it, it should work. In fact, Leeson solves solves this problem for me today. I, I, I have it running somewhere. I have my file server at home, runs uh, all, all my NAS stuff. It's on a static IP. Um, I switched it over to Leeson recently. Before then, you could guarantee whenever I went to a summit, the power would go off at my home and it would restart. And then 
the state of Linux encryption being what it was, I would have to ring home and get my girlfriend to punch in my encryption key while I read it out to her. Okay. Now it reaches out to a server um, in the US East, pulls back the key material. Um, an extra layer that we could put in that I didn't, I didn't mention because I was trying to keep all the diagrams nice and simple. Um, we do have a pre-encryption model for it as well, where, um, like in the case of my NAS, the keys that are kept in Leeson are encrypted with local keys that are kept on that box. So even if Leeson was completely compromised or somehow compelled to give keys out to the wrong machines, even though a UUID isn't guessable, let's say there's a, a vulnerability in Leeson and they're able to retrieve it, the keys would still be entirely useless. It does frustrate the key moving operation though because you have an extra step of wrapping and unwrapping. So it's a, it's a trade off that you have to decide whether or not you want to make. But thank you for asking the question because that reminded me to tell people about key wrapping as well. Uh, related to the distribution, the geolocation, and uh, in the to protecting the data for the storage, the Swift community is discussion about the uh, secret share method to use to protect data in the distributed storages. Mm -hmm. So the, this technique can be used for the another project. So how do you think about the, this technique, uh, secret share method? to protect data in the dis distributed disks. So the c can you uh, uh, integrate the project, this approach to your project? Uh, can we integrate that towards Leeson or towards the, the I'm not, I'm, I think it's a complex question. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards um, okay. so I can go run through a bit more of it with you. Okay, I see. Okay, I think that's everyone. Thank you so much for coming in for asking so many great questions. <laughs>